All right, so I uh, thought I'd talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, decision-making in a multi-engine pilot, and there's all there's some parts of that decision making that we get to do today and others that we don't you know we're uh, we're right now we're flying uh we took off from marco island florida it's the southwest corner of florida and we're flying over to uh, uh governor's island on in, uh i think it's eleuthera island in uh, the bahamas and then we're going to go on to providentialis and the turks and caicos so right now if you can see if you look around a little bit it's a whole lot of blue just a whole lot of blue which is really pretty. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. So I thought I would share with you just a little bit about, you know, uh, what, what we do in terms of uh, decision planning or, or performance planning, decision planning, all those types of things. So the first thing is uh, takeoff planning or takeoff performance and climb planning that you guys uh, that are watching this probably work on in classes. You work on like your multi-engine class, your flight instructors. You talk about what are we going to do if we lose an engine. You talk about IFR operations when you lose an engine. And of course, in North Dakota or down here in the Bahamas, we're not concerned necessarily about terrain. But when you guys start flying outside of Grand Forks, you certainly will. The other thing you always have to know is if you're heavy in a piston twin, you may not have that single engine climb performance. And so if that's the case, you need to know ahead of time what you're going to do. So, for example, you know, back when I used to do check rides in the Seminole, I would I would say, okay, let's say we run all the numbers and we end up with a negative 50 foot per minute climb rate. Let's say we're flying out of you know the old the old Denver you know hot summer day and we get negative 50 uh, foot per minute climb rate. You know, some people will say, oh, then I'm not going to take off, and I go, well, why not? And they're like, well, because I can't climb single engine, and I go, okay, would you would you take off out of Denver in a Cessna 172? And they're like, well, yeah, and I'm like, well, okay then why wouldn't you take off in this thing, you know? Like, a 172, what's what's that thing's performance if it loses an engine? Uh, you know, you, you're going to have to force land it. So the same type of decision planning goes into um, a multi-engine. You have to think about, first of all, your performance. Then you get into terrain clearance requirements. So if you fly out the mountains, there's going to be procedures that you have to make sure you're familiar with in terms of obstacle departure procedures, standard instrument departure procedures. You have to be familiar with those in order to make sure that you have the safety in the event that you lose an engine. And of course, you might have different decision planning if you're VFR or if you're IMC, right? If, you go in, if you're in the clouds, you can't see the granite rocks other than what you might have on your avionics, it's important that you know what you're going to do. So like when we fly in the airlines, we have uh, different types of engine failure procedures. We have simple procedures, which is just a heading. So we'll brief it ahead of time. We'll say, you know, like out of Minneapolis, you know, we're just going to fly basically runway heading up to X, you know, number of feet, clean the airplane up, come back around and land. Sometimes you fly in simple special procedures. And that would be an example of like, hey, there's just one you know, obstacle out in front of you, it's going to be a single turn, and then, you know, you're good to go. You clean up on that heading. Others, like if you look at Las Vegas, Las Vegas has complex special departure procedures. So, like, if you look, you know, prime examples, if you're taking off to the west in Vegas, you've got a big wall in front of you, okay? Well, so if there's an engine failure right away, there's one procedure. Then past a certain point or altitude, there's another procedure. And if you're even further along the road, there's another procedure. And that one is actually just stay on the DP. So you really have to brief that stuff ahead of time because if you're in the middle of an emergency, you just you have to be ready for it. So we'll put that stuff usually in our FMS, like you know different fixes and then a heading that we would turn to. Um, but you just want to make sure that you brief that ahead of time. And that's part of that decision planning. So take off, climb performance, that's always important. And then, hang on. Miami Center, 125.7. All right, Miami on 125.7. 902 be have a great day. Platoon and the Vice One arrival, climb and maintain, level 220. Platoon, Vice One arrival, and up to 220 on 1027 Miami 902, Bravo Alpha, 15000. No, 902, Bravo Alpha, Miami Center, the NASA altimeter 3020. 3020, 902 BA. 3020. So as we showed you right in the beginning, we're in the middle of the water. And so at the airlines, we fly what's called ETAPs, or the old joke, which it doesn't stand for, we call it engines turn or passengers swim. And basically that's when you're extended over water operations, where you actually are further than 60 minutes from a suitable alternate, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into, like, all the legal requirements, but basically, you're flying out over the middle of nowhere, and if you're more than 60 minutes from an alternate, you got to have a plan if something happens. Now, in this case here, I mean, maybe this is an easier screen to see 
for now. So we are, you know, presently kind of right over the middle of this this uh, gap here between the mainland and the big island of the Bahamas. So what I did here on my iPad was I basically, you know, you can do this on four flight. I'm sure you've all done that. But I basically gave a point to point one of the shorter areas. And I said, okay, you know, right about there in the middle, if I lose an engine, I'm going to turn and divert back to the mainland. And if I lose an engine at this point, we're already past it, I would continue up into the Bahamas. So um, that's just something simple. And, and I think I measured it about 100 miles. In this aircraft, that's a total of 30 minutes between the islands or between the between land. And that's about 15 minutes. I mean, that's not really a big deal. However, I had planned on being further north. So I would always be within about seven or eight minutes of an island. So I planned to set 11,000 feet so we could see all the pretty islands. But they took us south uh, around Miami quite a ways. So, so what I did was I asked for 15,000 feet. That would give me about 13 minutes. Not quite enough to make land, but at least it would get us some options. I did notice it's not even on the map. There's a small sliver of an island over here. So, you know, if you lose, like in, a, in our case, if we had a dual engine failure, you know, what are you going to do? That would likely be a fuel contamination problem um, or or high altitude icing so I'm not going to get icing today but you could have fuel contamination usually you would find you would find that out a lot early but you know my plan is okay first of all can I find land and get close to that island and land you know just offshore um, the other alternative would be to find a cruise ship or like a, you know a container ship uh, try and find that but you want to have like some sort of idea and this this sort of uh, 100 miles over the water is very similar for us in Lake Michigan Ray J at one one thousand. Okay, we don't have that on our flight plan. Can you give us the uh, the uh, fix? Nine zero two Bravo Alpha, correction. Descend and maintain one one thousand. Okay, we'll descend and maintain eleven thousand. I two B. Number four zero three Romeo. Uh, okay, we're gonna go to eleven. Plus BFR for exchange approved. Roger BFR, Romeo Gas, good day, thank you. Yeah, so as I was saying, this is similar for us for um, for Lake Michigan. Um, and it's about 100 miles over there, about, you know, 15, 20, uh, 20 minutes away from, from the edge or the, the shoreline. And so uh, a few years ago, I ended up buying uh, just a pack of uh, life preservers, just like you find an airline. You know, you pull, you, know, you pull the thing, it opens it up, and just, just like you see on all the airline demos, just because I was concerned that, you know, what if something happened and what if you had to go down in that scenario just to have some uh, survival equipment. Um, Last thing I was going to tell you guys for interesting decision making, extraordinary decision making. Uh, I hope he doesn't get mad at me, Lou. I hope he don't get mad at me for pointing this out. Lou Morton, former student, fl was flying to Cirrus out over the Pacific, doing a ferry flight from the mainland out to Hawaii. He had the ferry tanks and had a malfunction of his of his transfer equipment, and they made a fascinating video uh, about that Cirrus decision making. I highly, highly, highly recommend that video. Just you probably Google, you know, Lou Morton or Cirrus parachute pole over the Pacific. It is an outstanding video. Um, Lou, you did a phenomenal job. And, uh, and that really goes to show, like, there was all kinds of, like, you know, what's the least worst thing to do? And it was, uh, anyway, just did a phenomenal job. And it's all on video. So really great video. Uh, so anyway, a lot of decision-making goes into flying uh, the twins, especially a piston twin. You know, obviously pistons are not nearly as reliable as turbines. So it, it's very important to make those decisions ahead of time. And now I don't know if you can go over here. We can easily see the uh, the island out there. Oh, yeah, you can see that. So we're getting pretty close now, and uh, it's always a relief to get back over the land. Anyway, hope you guys learned something from it, and if you have any questions, for sure, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks for watching.